All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the JavaScript SEO office hours for this week. And um, I see that we have a few people in the Hangout uh, with me as well. And we have a bunch of questions that were submitted. So I'm thinking that we have quite a bit to go through. Is there uh, anyone in the Hangout who wants to already ask a question before I dive into the YouTube submitted questions? So uh, I have a question <laughs> for sure. the beginning stuff. It's, it's OK. Uh, so um, we have one problem, science two mounts. We have add two index uh, XMLs to our so uh, search console. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have two sitemaps. Two, two index sitemaps. Aha, OK. Uh, with sub-sitemaps. Aha, OK. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, we have a look in our programmers, and we can't see any dif uh, difficult with this. And the point is uh, how we can maybe check from Google if the um, sitemap is not really good or something else. Then um, the Google Search Console show us uh, no trouble information, but only read two sitemaps from the second uh, index sitemaps from around about 600 sitemaps. You mean we like URLs from the sitemaps? Not You don't have 600 sitemaps, right? No, no. We have 600 sitemaps. How, how many pages does your website have? Uh, around about, let me not lie, uh, over 1 million. We have uh, 3D parts with configurations. And right. But why, so do you could... have, why do you have 600 sitemaps? Uh, this is catalogs, uh, catalog sitemaps with uh, paths from the catalogs. For example, we have paths from MIN, mm -hmm. and they make uh, something like screws and uh, engines and something else. And you can go to us and download 3D files from this to use right. it for your CAD models and so on. Right. But why is there a separate sitemap for just that? Why is that not part of the like general sitemap? I mean, I get the point that some websites are nesting their sitemaps, but um, not for like a million um, URLs. That doesn't sound you, like. Um, I afraid we need to split by fifty thousand sitemaps. As, as uh, sites uh, links. The, okay. yeah, yeah, we need to split. And uh, then we need to make a new sitemap. I don't know where the, where the maximum number of URL is, actually. But let me double check if we can. Sitemaps is a little outside of what I'm normally dealing with. But. OK, so with the sitemap question, I'm not 100% sure because that's a little outside of my uh, area of main expertise. Um, mm. But generally speaking, so if I understand correctly, the problem was that we are not seeing all of your nested <laughs> sitemaps, or we're not seeing, or we're not mm. indexing all the URLs from the sitemap. Um, so the problem is the second index sitemap. Uh, let me explain. The second index sitemap um, have over 600 uh, sitemaps. I'll index sitemap. Right, hold on, hold on. Uh, so you have a sitemap uh, XML, and then in the sitemap XML, you are specifying other sitemaps, right? Yes. And now we're talking about one that is specified in there. Like you have some. Uh, no, no, no. We have two okay. of this. We have we have one sitemap with right. specified sitemaps, uh, one index sitemaps. And the mm -hmm. second index sitemaps have the problem that only the second and the five elements, the second and the five uh, sitemap in this uh, index sitemap mm -hmm. is only got read. Anything else is ignored. And I don't understand why he look for the second and the five element, not for the first and so. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That should not happen, generally speaking. I would bring that up either in the Webmaster Forum or in the uh, general SEO office hours with John, because mm. he might know something that I don't know about this kind of thing. OK, OK. Good. Awesome. Sorry that I didn't. I, I wasn't <laughs> no. the right person to answer this one. No problem. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Now, I think I take one from YouTube. 
we are in the process of replacing the HTML text content of our pages with, sorry, uh, with JavaScript fill text commands on HTML5 canvas. That's not a good idea. Uh, are there any plans to index text and images canvases in the near future? I can't predict the future. I can't make announcements um, of that sort. Like I can't. I don't know. I don't. We don't have any plans uh, like ready for public highlight that we are planning on indexing anything in text or uh, sorry, indexing text and images or in canvases. What are the recommendations for exposing this text content in a way the indexer can actually read it without violating cloaking guidelines? Honestly, for accessibility reasons to begin with, you should not do this. Uh, I know a bunch of projects that try to do this like successfully and nicely and fancily. They all are not around anymore um, because it turns out to be quite hard to do this, what your browser does for you for free. You can't use CSS. You can't use um, any of the browser given like re re resize or, or um, responsive um, paradigms. You have to basically calculate everything yourself. That is a pain for both people using screen readers as well as um, as bots, and it also is not very performant usually, unless you're really like using something like WebGL uh, acceleration for this. But I would just refrain from doing it unless you have a very very important use case where you 100% have to do this, and then you just take the like take the bite the pill that you are not getting indexed. But Honestly, I would not do that. To avoid impacting page load times, you would like to populate this HTML strictly after the visual text is painted to the canvas. What signals can we send receive to ensure that text is ready before the index is snapshots the page? There's no such thing. Just build a normal HTML page. Trust me, you'll be better off. Um, that's that. So canvas uh, and image rendering things, mm, I would not do that. Now. More people joining. That's lovely. Um, you advised on okay on April eight. That's a good one. On April eight, you advised against no script in favor of native lazy loading or um, like something like, uh, for instance, uh, the intersection observer. What they say is like the Google suggested way. Um, but the former have browser compatibility issues. So the later, you will not show images for users without JavaScript. Well. First things first, I didn't say I advise strictly against using NoScript. That was something that was blogged about, but it's not what I said. I said I would not recommend relying on it 100% and for the future, because you don't know if we actually at some point might deprecate that. Uh, we are not having plans to deprecate that either, but I just say like it's a fallback solution that I would not exactly uh, suggest. The native lazy loading, yes, that is not compatible with all the browsers. A bunch of browsers don't support it. But I think it is a nice progressive enhancement for those people who are using a browser that supports it. And more browser support will follow in the future, I'm pretty sure, because it's kind of like an obvious thing to do. Um, and those who are on an older browser might not get it, but they, they're not losing something. It's, it, they don't have the best experience, sure. But that's like you have to draw a line somewhere. If you understand your user base well enough to say, like, oh, most of our users are actually on a browser that don't support it, which I think I would argue today is actually the case for most websites, to be honest. Um, you can do both the NoScript fallback on top of the JavaScript way that we can index it, because that doesn't hurt you either, especially because the NoScript fallback is for those users who are not using JavaScript, and they would get the the images nonetheless. And then the, the crawlers who understand JavaScript um, get the, the lazy loading that works um, using, for instance, an intersection observer, whereas the browsers that don't support JavaScript get the fallback or sorry, crawlers that don't support JavaScript also get the no script version. I think that's fine to do. I'm just saying like you want to reevaluate that in the future. It's not like a bulletproof thing forever, unless you are using the um, the way that works for Chromium-based browsers, um, because that's, I think, what Bing uses as well, because they use Edge, and Edge is now a Chrome-based browser, uh, as well as we are using a Chromium to render. So we are seeing the content. I'm pretty sure Bing will see the content. You would have to test with their tools uh, to make sure that they see the content. And that's not going away, whereas the NoScript fallback, if that's your only set of strategy, it might go away at some point uh, in the future. Might being the keyword here. 
I'm not saying we are about to deprecate it. What I'm saying is it's not a future-proof thing uh, for, for for SEO purposes. It is still future-proof for your users. So go with that. But anyway, you would have to more or less like evaluate um, what works for your user base and what for your use case as well. So Martin, uh, mm -hmm. that is my question. I have a follow-up question on that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, I also type it here. So um, okay. uh, uh, compared to the method that you just say using JavaScript and fall back to uh, non-script, there is another method that also progresses uh, uh, enhancement. Uh, mm -hmm. By a lighthouse, I pay. I pay the. Uh, mm -hmm. What they do is that they 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 say that there you actually can do one thing. They said uh, you use native lazy loading first, but you don't mm -hmm. put SRC first. Uh, you put data SRC in the native lazy loading, and then you use uh, JavaScript to detect if uh, the browser support. If not, they polyfill the JavaScript to do. Uh, to, so, so they basically lazy load a uh, native mm -hmm. lazy and then pull back to JavaScript uh, mm -hmm. load. Uh, so my question here is that first, how do we? Uh, so my question here is that first, how do we specify the placeholder in this kind of fallback? Because um, uh, it, it's like uh, if you use lazy uh, JS lazy load first uh, directly, you know the placeholder is the INC source. Uh, mm -hmm. and but if you do this kind of progressive enhancement, how do we uh, specify placeholder? And another issue is that compared to this and use direct JavaScript lazy load uh, directly and fall back to no script, which one is more safe? And um, uh, and uh, 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 yeah. There's, there's uh, no simple answer to this. Is the is the thing like you would have to to make up your mind and and I basically you would have to look at the different approaches and you would have to decide what works for our use case. If you know that pretty much everyone is on a browser that supports JavaScript and the no JavaScript case is something that you can reasonably ignore or you are already ignoring in the rest of your development, then I would say uh, using using either the JavaScript approach with the intersection observer, or maybe using this hybrid approach that web.dev uh, documented here um, is, a, is a very fine way to go about it. Um, you can always also specify the no script version. That never hurts. It won't hurt you. You should not rely on the no script version to fix all your SEO problems in the next 100 years. But for now, it works even for Google Search, uh, which would just mean like you have multiple ways of actually giving us the image. We don't really worry about that. It's not a problem to have a no, no script fallback. So if you want to be like super foolproof and make sure that it always displays images, you can use one of the lazy loading strategies plus the no script fallback, for instance. Um, you can use the approach that, that uh, web.dev took I'm guessing you, as a placeholder, you can just specify the image source here on top of the data source. I guess that's fine. I'm not sure about that. You would have to ask whoever wrote this article, which is not clear from the page itself. Yes, it is. Uh, the authors were Hussein, Adi, or Matthias uh, would be the persons to ask for the specific uh, approach that they, they documented here. But yeah, so like no script will be foolproof and um, is a way of making sure that it also works when JavaScript does does fail. Okay, thank you so much. You're just, welcome. Just a follow up question, not really related. Uh, a lot of uh, developer worry about a no um, a browser don't support JavaScript, but actually, how many how many browsers actually don't support JavaScript now? So the, that's a and that's I a good question, and the answer is that's the wrong question. Um, because the thing is, yes, pretty much every browser supports JavaScript, but there are privacy uh, extensions that some people use that are very, very clearly like disabling pretty much everything unless the, the user specifically opts in. So they might not see the content immediately. Um, there can always be transmission issues if you're on a mobile phone. And the HTML, as the HTML arrives over the wire, can already start rendering. With the JavaScript, I have to wait until everything comes down. And if my JavaScript is like half a megabyte, and then in the middle of it, the connection is cut, the JavaScript won't execute, and I won't see anything on my phone. So that's the case that you might want to prepare yourself for, but only if you have 
data that you need to prepare for that. So if you have, for instance, like telemetry on um, on the errors that you're getting, and there's like errors that support the hypothesis that JavaScript loading failed for a bunch of your users, you might want to consider that a case for no script. Um, but generally speaking, pretty much every browser has JavaScript, and it normally works. Um, okay. there, there are cases where it might not work. OK, thank you so much. You're welcome. When the static HTML and the rendered JavaScript title in the metadata differ, will Google always use the rendered JavaScript metadata? Fun fact, usually yes, but we might also just consider it a bad title if the title does not seem to be relevant to the actual page content, and then we just might rewrite it. The same goes if like the query suggests that we might want to rewrite the title, we might rewrite the title. So, uh, But generally speaking, the rendered JavaScript title should take precedence unless there is something going wrong in rendering, which is unlikely. Do we have questions from the Hangout before I continue with the submitted questions? I have another one. Sure. OK, so, so my question here is that, um, so uh, since uh, HTTP2 is supported by most of the browser now today and most of the websites using them, uh, is that still important to limit HTTP requests for external JavaScript and CSS? Because they are download parallel anyway. Like, for example, if I have 100 external Java JavaScript and they are deferred, so async, would it still be a problem for uh, page speed? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think there is still a maximum of multiplexing that can happen in HTTP2. I'm not sure what that would be like, but I'm not sure if you can just say like, okay, I'll just like get everything over HTTP2 in parallel. Uh, some browsers and some connections might still fall back for whatever reason to HTTP1. Um, so. Hmm. I would be a little careful with that. I would still try to minimize the amount of resources that you're loading specifically, which is like this weird thing. You have to find the balance between minimizing the amount of resources and also making sure that you're not forcing the entire application bundle down for, on every request. And like, so like, it's a dance between splitting the bundles reasonably and minimizing the amount of external resources. Oh, okay, so so from what I heard is that it's still safer to try to not request too much request from. It Xbox. definitely is safer um, until the, we are very very surely in HTTP two land. Um, also, for instance, uh, Googlebot will still fetch from HTTP one at least for now. So. Mm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So. I run site audits for clients, and one point is to check na JavaScript navigation. But I thought Google can follow JavaScript navigation. Are there any cases where it can't? What's the proper way to execute this so it's not a problem? Is the person who asked this question in this Hangout, maybe? No. OK, generally speaking, uh, if you use JavaScript to generate your navigation, that should be fine. Um, if you are generating proper links, and proper links are links that have a proper URL and an href and are an anchor tag and all of that, then that should be fine. If your navigation, for some reason, is a dropdown, we are not going to interact with that. Uh, if your navigation is, and when I say dropdown, I specifically mean like an HTML select element uh, or something like that. If your navigation is a bunch of span elements or li elements with an on-click handler, we're not going to see that. Um, but that's not specific to JavaScript navigation. That's just generally specific to links. Um, so just make sure that we see the content rendered in our testing tool. So you can uh, use Google Search Console or the rich results test or the mobile friendly test to make sure that the content is uh, in the DOM. And then with that, you should be fine. That's pretty much it. Oh, that's another good question uh, that I saw earlier. Many sites we review enjoy using full page hero images that require a scroll to see the rest of the content. All data is in DOM without scrolling. So Google render look poor, uh, like the screenshot that you get looks poor. Can this be an indexing handicap to the content you need to scroll to, similar to hidden content? No. No, that's not a problem. If it's in the DOM, that's fine. That's it. Don't worry about it. Uh, just make sure that it's in the DOM. That's really important. 
Do we have questions from the live audience? Uh, sure, I have a question. Sure. Um, maybe a little bit uh, a crawling problem with Googlebot mm -hmm. and JavaScript. So uh, we have for around about five months changed our URL schema. So from URL uh, question mark Q is uh, equals blah 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 to mm -hmm. slash folder uh, mm -hmm. like stuff. So and we have uh, from time to time the problem that Google crawled new URLs <laughs> with uh, the wrong yeah the wrong URL schema with the old one. Right. And this is uh, this is. How about the last one is from one week? Mm -hmm. And the question is, is this the problem from Google that they catch uh, the JavaScript too long? And when yes, how long catch uh, the Google bot the JavaScript? That is one possibility. Uh, it is possible that we are seeing the old URLs because your JavaScript wasn't updated. That is definitely a possibility. Uh, we are trying to catch as long as possible. We might cache longer than you specify in the cache header. The best thing that you can do is version your JavaScript assets. Um, yeah, this, uh, yes, that. we we do this, and we can then, see if I, yeah. Sorry. Then it then that shouldn't be a problem. There yeah. are certain situations where we might hit the old version, but it's very unlikely. What can also happen is that we're just seeing somewhere else linking to the old URLs. Okay, uh, and the second question is. Uh, if I look at this link, mm -hmm. he said to me the canonical is like the link he get, and this is totally wrong. He can't get this canonical. We have write something that we change the canonical to the new one. Safe. That is great. However, that's not how that works. Uh, the canonical that you give us is a hint to us. Oh, there are situations where we might decide that um, that's a nice hint that you give us, but we think the other thing has a good reason to become um, the canonical lead in this case. Uh, so we, we basically cluster the URLs, mm -hmm. and then we choose the leader from that cluster. Right? We say, like, OK, mm -hmm. so all of these URLs point to the same thing. And then we look at signals. And one of the signals is uh, the canonical that you pick. Mm -hmm. But very often, webmasters pick the canonical incorrectly. So we can't just like use that and then be merry with it, because we would break half of the internet that way uh, in Google Search. Mm -hmm. So what we do is then we look at other things, like how many inbound links do we have on this? And how often do we call these? And what kind of content do we see at these? And um, the canonical can change over time. So if these old URLs are dying out, then I wouldn't worry too much about that, especially if, yours, if your server setup is anyway redirecting to the right URL, then whatever. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry too much about it. It can be a little bit of a pain to actually track reports in uh, Search Console then, because they're mm -hmm. using the canonical. I'm aware of that. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have an easy answer for this. Uh, if you have a sample URL and you post that in the webmaster forum and you point me to the thread or you post it here in the in the chat or in the um, mm -hmm. in the YouTube uh, thread for for the questions, uh, I can take a look at it, but I can't like do much about it. I can only maybe at least explain why this happens, uh, but I, there's not not that much action that can I uh, can be taken by me or anyone else really. Um, if the old URLs are disappearing from the internet and you are also like submitting the new URLs via sitemap, and you're like making sure that pretty much everything redirects to that new URL to be the target, uh, then eventually we'll see that, OK, so yeah, the old URL that we picked as a canonical is no longer a good candidate for this. And then we might switch over to the canonical that you're giving us. Shouldn't cause a problem, but um, is a little inconvenient, especially in reporting, I'm aware. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you again. You're welcome. So let's pick another question from here. Mm. 
bunch of them aren't actually like JavaScript related, but that's fine. Hi, Martin. How does Googlebot handle the spoiler boxes? What's a spoiler box? Like this. There's a link, and then there's an href to some ID, and then there's a onclick handler that does a bunch of stuff with jQuery. Oh, that's an easy question. We don't click on links. So um, if the content, it looks like you're not loading different content. You're just moving things around and making them visible or invisible. Uh, so if the content is in the DOM, how it looks like to me, this will be mostly fine. If it's uh, hidden content, we might think it's not that important. Like if, it, if this is your main content, the spoiler box is your main content, you do not want to hide this, neither from the user nor from the bot. Uh, I think if it's hidden, we will consider it. We might not highlight it in the snippet, um, but we will see the content in the DOM if it's in the DOM. If it's just in the DOM and hidden, we will see the content. So, But we won't click on the thing, so we won't ever see the spoiler box open, I think. Which should not be a problem. Right. More questions from the audience? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, All right. A little bit um, kind of more performance and speed related, really. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly when you've got something like an SPA, um, the initial load might be much slower than obviously navigating through the routes or something that hydrates. But I assume that uh, maybe. Google would consider maybe that first load because that's what's important from Google's perspective, rather than speed that might be, you know, sort of someone's using the app. Would that be a roughly right assumption? Or? That is that sounds pretty much right in the sense of um, yes, sure. The moment a new user comes in, the website will be slow, and then it will be faster on subsequent uh, uh, navigations. That's the, that's the same kind of situation that you run into, especially if you use a service worker, right? Uh, if you use a service worker and your service worker caches everything on the first uh, first load and then everything else is, is fast, that's fantastic for the user, except that you still need to worry about the initial load time because that's what a first-time user sees. And the first-time users are normally the ones that are uh, from a user, user experience point of view. right? If I'm doing a user study, the first visits are what I most worry about because those are the people who are most volatile. Right? They come to your website the first time, and they're like, oh, this is not loading, and then they are gone. So all the things that your service worker or your single page application did in the background are lost. Um, so I would, I would say for page speed, you definitely want to have a close look at the first load experience. Thank you. Awesome. Also, just that reminds me. Someone recently somewhere asked me to explain a service worker in layman's terms, and I'll try. If the person who asked that was is in here or sees this recording, you'll be happy. A service worker, very fundamentally said, is basically an intermediary between your application and the network. So you can imagine like, if you have a normal website without a service worker, the website, whatever it does, when it sees like, oh, there's an image that I need to load, it goes to the network and fetches the image from the network. Right? That's what it does. Um, there's also a cache that the browser controls, but that might or might not happen. So like the website goes, oh, there's an image I need to load. And then the browser might go like, you don't have to go to the internet. I happen to have it here. It's like, oh, cool, cool, nice. But you don't really have control over that cache as much um, because you only control that via your server headers. And if there's a proxy in between, it might strip the headers. And there's like a bunch of things that can go wrong with caching. Now, a service worker is basically a little program. It is literally a JavaScript program that you can um, specify for your site. I can say, like, OK, I'm owning example.com, and I want to install this little service worker, which is a little JavaScript program, where whenever the network is somehow involved, this little program gets woken up and gets to decide what to do with that situation. So basically, like, if I'm the service worker now, and there's the website over there, and the website goes, oh, I have an image to fetch, that will basically ring a little bell. I will wake up and be like, oh, you need to fetch an image. All right, and now it's the decision and the job of the service worker to figure out what to do. It can do a bunch of things. It can just be like, oh, you need an image. OK, cool, you need that something, something, header.png, sure, and then goes off to the network and fetches it. That's, that's the dumbest service worker possible because it does what the browser would do. 
But it also has options to, for instance, have its own little cache, which is basically a storage room. So the service worker gets woken up, get me that image, and it goes like, oh, all right, OK, cool. Uh, in that case, I'll get it, and I'll make a copy, and I'll put that copy in my storage room. Here you have it. And then the next time the, the website asks for the image, it has, again, more choice. Because now I have it in my storage room, so I can either go like, this might be old, and there might be a new version of this image, but this is fine. This is just the logo of the company, for instance. Here you go, right away, without even considering the network. And then I can optionally ask the network if I want to update my copied version of that image, or maybe I only do that like once a week, or whatever. Like I have the full flexibility as the service worker. So you program how your application behaves. The biggest advantage of that is that now the website, without making any changes to the website, if my service worker stores everything it sees in a cache, and maybe I give it even when I install the service worker, I give it a list of things to put in the in its cache beforehand. So basically, the first time I visit the website, um, sure, the thing has to go to the network and fetch the image, but my service worker also fetches everything on the site and puts that into the cache. And then the next time I'm asking, I can get it out of the cache right away. That's a lot faster than actually going to the network. And the biggest advantage is if I'm offline, and my service worker is programmed in a way to check its cache before it even tries to go online. If I'm offline, it doesn't matter that I'm offline, because my service worker has all the things that it needs already in the cache. So we can actually function independent of the network. We can also say, like, OK, um, the website asks for this image. I get it from the, from the thing, and I try to update it from the network. Oh, I'm offline. OK, in that case, I don't update it from the network. So you get a middleman that you control. And you control it by writing a little JavaScript, uh, which is your service worker. So that's roughly it in layman's terms. I hope that made sense. Um, so that's done. And service workers are really, really flexible, because I get to program uh, the service worker to whatever I need it to be. I, can, I once built a service worker where I ran into the situation that the API was done using post requests only. Post requests can't be cached, which is bad. So what I did instead is I basically rewrote the front end side of things to actually make get requests. And the service worker that was in the middle would take the get requests and turn them into the actual post requests and then cache the results because we can cache for, for, post, uh, for get requests. So that, that way, I, or actually, no, hold on. We made post requests, but I, I basically knew that if it's an API post request, I decided I wanted to cache it anyways, even though for some API calls I couldn't cache it. So I got to program a service worker that very specifically cached things from an API that was by default uncacheable, which is quite cool. Uh, if you don't have a service worker installed or if the service worker fails for some reason, you would still make the request straight to the backend and get the, the data back. It would just take longer. So service workers are a really cool progressive enhancement way of like adding niceness to users where the service worker successfully installs. That's kind of nice. Right. Any further questions from you all in the call? Oh, yes, actually, there's one in the, in the chat. Is that, is that a question we've seen? All right, so we've seen JavaScript play a major role in how websites are built and how JavaScript frameworks adopt it and take advantage of it. Most of the concerns now run around HTML and JavaScript rendering. What do you foresee will be the next challenges for the upcoming years regarding the use of JavaScript on websites? Uh, honestly, making things faster. Um, JavaScript still has this, this really not great um, property of uh, inviting you to build a bunch of stuff that will not perform fantastically well uh, for two reasons. One reason is that it can't be parsed progressively. Uh, you just cannot. HTML, you can start rendering HTML as it arrives. You don't have to wait until the entire HTML has arrived on your end. The same with CSS. You can progressively build the CSS tree um, from the data that you get from the network. You don't really have to, to deal with that. Whereas with JavaScript, you have to wait until the entire blob is over. And we are still not having easy to deploy and easy to build ways of doing server-side rendering. So that will be a thing where you would be able to build the JavaScript applications or the web applications with all the flexibility that JavaScript provides you with, but still have a fast experience for the user. So that will be something that is not easy to achieve right now that will hopefully get easier in the future. 
Um, then the entire, like, how do I split my bundles? That still requires a bunch of manual work from developers that hopefully we can somehow make easier uh, and, and the default thing to work. Um, so performance is going to continue to be a big avenue of change or playground for change, I hope. So do you think there will be attempts to make JavaScript render progressively or attempts to make to technically to make it possible or i i don't think that there is a technical possibility for that an imperative language as javascript is one um is not really it's not possible it's one of the downsides of like it gives you a lot of flexibility which is fantastic but it also gives you the downside of not being able to to start rendering as things happen because you need the entire context to actually be able to, to execute, uh, to parse and execute JavaScript. So I'm not sure that we're gonna see like progressive rendering JavaScript. I'm not sure where, um, where WebAssembly goes, but I, as far as I'm aware, WebAssembly has the same problem that you can only execute instructions uh, once you have the bundle compiled. But maybe we have a way of actually getting that working. That would be surprising and really cool. And we're in future territory, so I'm like, I don't know, maybe none of what I just said makes sense, or like tomorrow someone finds a way to actually do the thing that I found to be impossible. Um, but definitely also tooling is a big thing. Like a lot of a lot of websites, I would argue, that are built with JavaScript these days don't really have to be built with JavaScript. Uh, it's just the tool that... It's just a novelty, yeah. Not even, no, no, it's, I'm not saying that it's just a novelty and people like to play with it. It is just a way that allows you to build a lot of things very flexibly. And then you might be tempted to either use that for everything like a novelty, or you might have reasons for it. I remember when I was building a very dynamic web application where there was no way around it. Um, we did VR in the browser. There's no way in heaven that we can do that reasonably without JavaScript. We would have to run JavaScript. So it was a dynamic web application. But it also had a, a, an e-commerce kind of system attached to it. So that also needed to be built and actually maintained somehow. And we were a very small team. So the only reasonable way of doing this was to say, like, OK, so inst we can't just we can't afford having to run with two completely different systems. We can't afford to maintain a CMS and this applica application. The only way forward for us reasonably is to somehow integrate this into our existing system, which is a JavaScript web application. Uh, and so we ended up having like a Vue.js uh, powered blog. But because I was aware of the situation, I was like, OK, we, we as soon as possible, we need to figure out how to at least like server side render the static bits and figure out a way to like get the stat, like keep the static bits static without having to drag in a CMS or a completely different set of tools. Uh, that people have to deal with to publish something on the blog. So that's where server-side rendering then came in. And I remember that was 2016 or 17. Server-side rendering Vue.js applications wasn't the obvious thing. It wasn't easy. Uh, and that's the same for every other framework back in the days. And um, and that's just how you end up with situations where like, eh, we know it's not great, but that's the only thing that we can reasonably do at this point. So I would hope that the tooling ecosystem explores more way of giving you a well-lit path to success where that kind of thing is considered from the get-go. Because most of the frameworks that came out around 2014 until maybe like 2016 or something in that area of time, uh, were pretty much like client-side rendering, and then everything else was an afterthought. So I would like to see us steering into clearer waters where it's easier for developers to just build things that are progressively rendering by default, no matter how. Um, and that would fundamentally have to break down for ser to server-side rendering at this point. Uh, server-side hydration, uh, server-side rendering and hydration is a great thing, but it's it's not the default for most frameworks. What I what I like to see is that, uh, well, what makes me hopeful for the future, is that both uh, higher level frameworks like Next.js or Nux.js or uh, Angular Universal are getting a lot of traction recently, as well as that more and more people are jumping on what they call the Jamstack or jumping onto static site generators like Gatsby or Eleven uh, T 
or these kind of things where you can build things with a technology that you have at hand and you can use the same technology to build something much more dynamic, but you can also compile or pre-render it into HTML. I always like to think, uh, Marie, we are dealing with this now, what's gonna come ahead? And I know like the web technology that we use for websites has gone from like, all, you know, JavaScript always existed. It's like very as old as uh, almost as HTML. And then we had we had stuff like action script and flash and all of the things that came in and disappeared. So I'm just thinking like what's potentially gonna come afterwards and what's gonna um, is is JavaScript here to stay? Is it just something that we are gonna deal with it more natively going forward, more in the back end, more in the front end? Uh, I mean, this is just like things that I try to anticipate. Mm. just to think the problem ahead of the time. I, I think this is not a fad or whatever. I think this is a fundamental shift that has been going on for at least 15 years at this point, when we started with Ajax around 2005-ish. Um, it, it became clear that the web is a fantastic application platform. It used to be a document platform. Uh, that's how it was built and designed originally to exchange documents one, and make them linkable to each other. Um, since, since I would say 2012, 2013, 14, 15, uh, not, no, 2004, 2005-ish, uh, it became clear that we can build applications on this. And if I look at my daily work, I notice that a lot of this happens, like Meet, Google Meet, that we are using right now is in the browser it's an it's not that's not a website google meet is not a website maybe the landing page yes but what we are using right now is not a website that's an application google mail is not a website that's an application and i do things that i would do in an application uh google spreadsheets google docs uh, so many different things uh there's video editing tools there's um I don't know there's there's so much going on facebook twitter all these things social media social media is is a social media is actually an interesting thing because you could argue it's a website, but it's also more than a website. Um, so I think the the paradigm shift from a documentation platform to an application platform is powered and driven by JavaScript. And I don't think uh, this has been at least in like happening for the last fifteen years, um, maybe even longer. I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, and I don't think that we will fully replace JavaScript with something else anytime soon either. So I would say, like, prepare yourself for JavaScript to stay around. It's just that we are learning where the limitations are, and we're learning where the real world hits the, the hopefulness of, uh, of JavaScript developers in the way of, like, oh, I, I can do this with JavaScript. I don't have to deal with servers at this point. And then it's like, oh, yeah, but if I deal with the server, I get a lot of benefits from that. Um, I do also hope that we continue to work to bring things into a more declarative state of things. So for instance, I know that we are working for, uh, on things like HTML modules. Um, we are working on things like declarative shadow DOM. And hopefully, eventually, we might get declarative uh, web components where we can then hopefully build things with a little less reliance on, on JavaScript and have more of the web platform take care of it. Web platform meaning that the browser does the thing for you. Um, but I don't know. This can go either way. Uh, either we find out, OK, this, this really needs to be done in the web platform and needs to happen in the browsers, or no, this should not be done in the browsers. We definitely need to make sure that we are doing this uh, in JavaScript land, because that's easier to deal with. But JavaScript itself is not a fad, and using JavaScript to build web applications is not a not a short time fad. This will stay with us for a longer time, for sure. Yeah, th thanks for thanks for that. I didn't want to monopolize so much uh, the conversation. No, no but, worries, no worries. Uh, Can I ask just one question before you finish? Sure. So uh, uh, actually, I put in my question in the comments, but you didn't pick it. Um, uh, and let me see. It, it, it was posted like five minutes before the meeting should have started. So uh, it, I, I'm not really sure if, if whether it's uh, JavaScript related, but uh, I'm trying to get some kind of answer from any, anyone from Google. 
Mm-hmm. For some time now, I'm, I'm getting desperate. Uh, so, uh, one of uh, in company where I work, uh, one of the main uh, portals recently uh, had front page dropped from Google Index. Uh, it's actually not dropped from index, but it doesn't show in uh, search results. And uh, I- I'm not sure what could have been the reason of it, because uh, when I uh, check it in Webmaster Tools, it says that the page is indexed. And uh, I don't know, when uh, you try to uh, uh, see the uh, search results for this page, it shows that from 23 days ago, it uh, doesn't have any uh, appearances in search results. The problem with that question is, and I, I see the question in front of me right now, and the reason why I didn't pick it and why I would never, I, I would guess no one would pick this uh, in an office hour is that I don't know. Um, from the question itself, I, it can be anything. It can be a manual action. It can be that um, this is, an, is a display issue and we're actually seeing it in search results, or it can be, it can be everything. Um, without a URL, I, I don't know. I can't well, I, do much. Maybe I can send you a URL and you can we check. only We only take information through, through public channels. But I think if you're using the uh, Webmaster Forum, there will be ways of getting the URL to us uh, to double check if it's a problem on our side or if it's something. That, because the problem here really is I can't help you. Because if I would, that would be unfair to everyone else that I can't help. And if I would have to help everyone who has similar problems, I would not get anything else done. That's the reason why we're not offering private support. Um, what I can what I can do if you give me a URL is I can look if it's a problem on our end that affects other sites as well. And if it's a problem on our end that affects other sites as well, because it's a bug, then we would fix it. But I cannot answer what you need to do to fix this problem, unfortunately. The best the best place for, for placing this question really is the Webmaster Forum, because there other users might have an idea. And you can send these other users private messages, or basically, like, uh, I'm not sure how exactly the new system works, but basically, you can get messages to what we call product experts who are um, very fantastic users who help and dedicate their time uh, for other users struggling with things like this. And you can get the URL to them privately. You can also feel free to send me the URL separately, or you can again share it now, and then I can yes, have a look. I'll maybe um, that that would definitely work, and then maybe I can. Ah, right, okay. Maybe I can have a look at this and see. And it's only the 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 landing page, the home page. So it's only the home page. Other pages are not affected. Okay, uh, that's an interesting one. HTTPS www just making sure that I copy and paste it correctly, because there's like this weird YouTube changes, or actually Hangouts changes the links. Um, as far as I can tell, it has impressions. Plenty. So if your search console somehow shows you that this page does not have any impressions uh, from search results, then that would let me wonder if there is a bug in search console. Yes, well, uh, when I and everybody, anybody from the company or even the country uh, types in uh, U-turn, which is a keyword that was uh, most indexed uh, for, for this page, uh, uh, you don't see the uh, this page as, slam, as first search result. It's actually the section on, on the site, which is uh, U-turn.hr slash uh, uh, VSD, which is news. So, so if I go to the well, if if you try to search type in uh, just looking at keyword, uh, it, it won't be the first uh, results in uh, Google results. I mean, there is a. It's not the landing page that is the the highest ranking result, but that's a ranking question now. This is no longer a a um, an indexing issue or like some JavaScript issue that we have the content. It does show up. Um, your site shows up multiple times just like subsites of it, not the front page, which might mean that we think the front page is not a good hit for this specific thing, for well, this specific query. Well, uh, that started happening, like I said, 23 days ago. And uh, uh, this was a page that was 
uh, best ranked uh, Google index, and uh, in like two days, it uh, from I don't know uh, three hundred thousand results per day fell to zero. So uh, I think that is possible. I mean, the the first thing is you say zero. And that's not something that I can see here. I see you have impressions. So like people are clicking on it in in, uh, in search results. People are seeing it in search results. Um, it can't be zero. So it must be if whatever tool you what tool are you using that says this this does not have any impressions? Uh, I'm using Google Webmaster, so I can send you. Um... Interesting. Uh, that, because that sounds like there is a problem with the um, with the reporting on this page rather than than the actual page because you do have impressions on this. Well, uh, I I don't think I have impressions for the um, for the home page exactly. Let me just... You do. I do. Yes. Um, um, this might be a reporting issue, if any. Uh, is it possible to? Send, uh, I'm not. I don't think you can send like screenshots. So again, let me let me like reiterate. The best place for this is the webmaster forum. Okay. Uh, okay. And if it turns out to be, sorry. Uh, well, um, I'm I'm happy that you gave me some answers, and I'll try to. Sure. Get, yeah. Not a problem. That's what I'm here for. And um, even though this isn't JavaScript related. Uh, yeah, I mean, it yeah. seems to be seems to be fine. From what I can see in our tools, uh, it does have impressions. It does have clicks from search. So there's nothing that prevents it inherently. Um, Could I ask a JavaScript related question? Sure. Hi, you look wonderful. It's good to see you. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have a site that is executing a third party scripts via JavaScript. The bit of a problem is that they seem to, um, you, you fire this sort of JavaScript and it's inviting a lot of friends to the party. And it appears to be causing a layout interruption. Question uh, What would be the best way to execute these third party scripts in a way that they're not interrupting uh, the time to interact with? Perhaps uh, limit the amount of resources Googlebot then has to exert to this third party script that calls a friend, that calls a friend, that calls a friend. It's got a crazy map. So the best way to to if if the third party script um, work with that is to give them the uh, defer attribute so that they are only loaded very well at the end of everything so that they can't inter interfere with the rest. Um, also move them as far down as possible on the side so that they get discovered as late as possible, and uh, that should be doing it. The thing is that with defer, um, it might be that if your application code somehow uses something from the third party script, then that can get it wouldn't be there to me. catch the metrics. I think that's the thing impeding it right now is they need that, that loop back for tracking. So would it be effective then to figure out if we could split that main bundle into perhaps the analytics needed and then the actual yeah. request for resources? Yeah, that could be an option. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Jamie. Thanks for popping by. All right, time for one last question. I have another question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, is it correction about native lazy loading? Uh, there, is there any specific condition to met to make la native lazy loading work? Because I see a lot of example is that there is a lot of web, uh, web page that use la native lazy loading. And when I tested using uh, desktop, it doesn't work. But when I use mobile simulator, they work. Uh, I have an example here, like this one. Uh, uh, when I use desktop, uh, I, I do the network tab, and you see that they they, they start loading before con uh, down construct, uh, even before down construct. But uh, if, if you use mobile simulator in the uh, dev tool, you will see that it actually only load when uh, the viewport is close approaching. Uh, do you have any idea of? Uh, is there anything that will happen to prevent uh, late loading happen on desktop side? Hey. Um, I'm guessing either this is a browser bug or they do something like somehow specify that they want this to be preloaded, or maybe there's like a service worker involved that preloads it that doesn't do that on mobile. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with the website. Uh, but generally, it should work on desktop. 
or should it? Let me actually see. Like, I have a very simple test page. Um, actually, no, I don't. Not for native lazy loading. I need to try that still. I would ask uh, the either the, the Google Chrome Devs account or maybe submit a bug in the Chromium bug tracker to just like get a feeling for it. But for that, I would highly recommend building like a very minimal uh, reproduction or reproduction test case where you're basically just like loading a bunch of images um, that are large enough to be out of the viewport as well um with late, native phase loading and if that doesn't work on desktop that sounds to me like that's a chromium bug i see so if that is a chromium bug it's not it not just might be no. might be so i mean if if that is the case then every uh every lady uh, native late loading will behave like that not just the website that i saw Pretty much. If well, I mean, it, it, it depends. Uh, it depends on the bug. If there is something that needs to happen to trigger that bug, then no, not every website will happen. Uh, will have I, that happen. But okay. if you if you can't reproduce it, then it's less likely that it's a Chrome bug. Then it's more likely. Like the the harder it becomes to reproduce, the likelier it is to actually be a problem of that specific website and and maybe others that are having similar problems. Um, okay, but that's a whole investigation. Hmm? Uh, I never did that in a, a lab environment, but I saw several web pages behave like that. So uh, you can. I mean, yeah. So I would I would try that with a reproduction case, and if you can reproduce it on pretty much every website, then it's definitely a browser bug. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So I am looking for university three png jpeg. This is a weird website. Png jpeg. Hmm. Um, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, right. In which case, I would think that I have exhausted the YouTube questions mostly. And I would think that we are over time a little bit, but that's fine. It's not that I have to be anywhere, it's locked down anyway. So in that case, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Um, these, the next version in this time slot and time zone will happen in two weeks uh, on the Wednesday again. And next week on Wednesday, I'll do a more APAC-friendly one uh, in a different time zone, kind of, basically. So if you are basically getting up very, very early or um, staying up very, very late for this office hours, there will be a better suited version for you next week as well. Thank you so much. Keep submitting questions uh, on, on the YouTube things for the upcoming uh, office hours. And thanks for hanging out with me. And have a fantastic day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.